Thanks for saying that. Okay, that's what's up. I got that. <laughs>
A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Development will come to order. Good morning and welcome to today's subcommittee hearing. I would like to thank the members of the subcommittee and our witnesses for joining us today as we examine ways in which we can continue to strengthen our national workforce development efforts and help more Americans get the skills they need to land in-demand jobs. In the last several years, we have seen an economic boom take place under the Republican leadership in Congress and the White House. The job market is strong and unemployment is at near historic lows. In fact, employers need more people to work for them. In May of this year, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS, reported that for the first time in BLS history, the number of job openings in the United States exceeded the number of job seekers nationwide. I've seen this firsthand in Kentucky's 2nd District. This August, I visit construction sites, factories, shipping facilities, and other businesses throughout my congressional district, and the one thing I heard from them, all of them, is how they needed more skilled workers. These are good jobs that some people, unfortunately, are missing out because they don't have the necessary skills. In a 2018 survey from the Manpower Group, 46% of employers in the United States reported they struggle to hire employees with the necessary skills for the job, and for the six year in a row, skilled trade jobs are the hardest positions to fill across the globe. The American workforce is presently facing a shortage of over six million skilled workers, and we need approaches at both the public and private levels to successfully bridge these skills gap. When I was growing up, my dad and many of the people in our town worked for the local Ford factory. Back then, if you have got a job with Ford, you entered a pipeline that taught you necessary skills as you moved up the ladder. Sadly, many of the factories that provided this kind of job security have shut down, including the one in my hometown. I'm not talking about Louisville. We still have two great Ford facilities in Louisville. We must find other ways to bridge the skills gap. In 2014, after years of hard work from the Education and Workforce Committee, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, was signed into law. WIOA made significant progress rebuilding our national workforce development system by promoting employer-led innovation in and access to work-based learning experiences like on the job, edu job education apprenticeship programs. By strengthening on the job technical education and apprenticeship programs, we can streamline the connection between education and the workforce and encourage more Americans to pursue in-demand jobs, improving their own earning potential and the national workforce as a whole. I want to continue this, the, this progress we've made in WIOA and a renewed focus on apprenticeships. That's why I work with my colleague and my good friend, Ranking Member Susan Davis, to establish the Apprenticeship Caucus. We held our first event earlier this summer, and we were brought a wide range of representatives together and talk about where, how Congress can support these programs. We also introduced the Apprenticeship Act, which would establish a grant program to expand apprenticeship programs. I look forward to con continuing the conversation about apprenticeships as we at today's hearing. I'm pleased to welcome today's witnesses, and I look forward to hearing their testimony as we discuss innovative ways we can develop our workforce and help more Americans learn valuable skills on the job. I now yield to the subcommittee's ranking member, Susan Davis, for her opening remarks. Thanks, and welcome back. Sure. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Welcome back to you as well. And I certainly want to thank all of our witnesses that are here with us today. As our committee looks to advance policies that build a highly skilled workforce, we must support training models that help students, help workers, and businesses succeed. So I'm proud to be here today to discuss the success of quality apprenticeship programs in meeting this goal. As we have heard in previous hearings on the topic, and we have been fortunate to hear from a number of people, apprenticeships are a method of on-the-job training that have successfully trained workers for centuries. The building trades and their employer, <clears throat> excuse me, their employer partners, for example, have used registered apprenticeships to produce highly skilled workers for decades. Because of this model's historic success, we were able to come together in a bipartisan manner under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, to encourage the workforce development system to partner with registered apprenticeship programs around the country. And investments in these programs over the last few years have expanded apprenticeships into new fields. But there is still so much room to grow. How can we continue to expand quality apprenticeships into new fields while allowing more non-traditional students to access these lucrative career pathways? 
So as we'll hear today from all of you, successful apprenticeship programs work with pre-apprenticeship programs in local community colleges to develop curriculum that gives apprentices stackable, transferable credentials and allows them to transition into other higher education pathways. These programs also work to educate teachers, educate families, and young people about the benefits of registered apprenticeships. As Chairman Guthrie uh, has said, we recently came together to introduce the Apprentice Act, which would allocate resources to increase the awareness of apprenticeship programs throughout the country. Funds could be used to publicize quality apprenticeship programs, inform educators, and train our administrators. I'm hopeful that our bipartisan commitment to the apprenticeship model will move our apprentice bill and offer thoughtful apprenticeship legislation through Congress. We know that apprenticeships must be prestigious enough, prestigious enough to attract students who seek the most challenging and aspirational programs. I also speak of the kitchen table discussions um, that all families have where families try to decide what career pathway is best for their children. Parents want to know that their children are receiving a quality education that will yield a widely recognized credential. And as we've heard from time and time again from both Republican and Democratic witnesses before this committee, the key to maintaining the prestige of apprenticeships is ensuring that we keep the qualities that have made these programs a success. We must ensure that while encouraging industry input in apprenticeships, there is also accountability to taxpayers, apprentices, and businesses. I agree with experts who are concerned about efforts to invest taxpayer dollars into programs that lack protections for students and their families. So I look forward to working with my colleagues on this committee to expand high quality, prestigious apprenticeship programs while ensuring that protections remain in place for students. I also believe that we can make apprenticeships more appealing by expanding them beyond the traditional trades. We'd like to see companies build upon the phenomenal work that the building trades have done to open up apprenticeships in new industries. And we know that we have to engage with all of our partners in this effort. Whether it is learning from the important work that unions have done in this space, asking businesses and industry to continue engaging with the Department of Labor's Office of Apprenticeships, we're looking to schools and nonprofit organizations to develop meaningful curriculum for apprentices. We know that this must be a collaborative process. If that's the case, let's give the appropriators clarity in the form of an authorization. I know that Ranking Member Scott, myself, and most of the Democrats on this committee support Representative Pocan's LEARN Act and are willing to have a markup on it tomorrow if the chair would schedule it. I know through my conversations with members on both sides of this committee that apprenticeships have great support. I hope we can come together in a bipartisan manner to promote these programs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, I will say pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, all members will be permitted to submit written statements to be included in the permanent hearing record. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days to allow such statements and other extraneous material reference during the hearing to be submitted for the official hearing record. I will now introduce the witnesses for this morning's hearing. Dr. Sharon Johnson is the Chief Executive Officer of the Shenandoah Valley Workforce Development Board in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Ms. Carol Reynolds, welcome back. I know you were at our round table. Ms. Carol Reynolds is the founder of United Industrial Services in Louisville, Kentucky. Mr. Mark Kesnick is president of the Wisconsin Regional Training Partnership in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Mr. B.J. Dernbach is the Assistant Deputy Secretary for the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development in Madison, Wisconsin. I now ask our witnesses to raise your right hand for being sworn testimony. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. And before I recognize you to provide your testimony, let me briefly explain our lighting system you will each have five minutes uh, to, to present your testimony. When you begin, the light in front of you will turn green. When one minute is left, the light will turn yellow. When your time has expired, the light will turn red. At that point, I will ask you to wrap up your remarks as best as you are able. Members will each have five minutes to ask questions following your testimony. So Dr. Johnson, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. 
Thank you. Um, it is an honor to be here today. Thank you, Chairman Guthrie, for the invitation and for the work of the subcommittee to prepare a talent pipeline to advance America. I have several work-based learning successes to share as you consider building, rebuilding the workforce through apprenticeships. The workforce development system, especially the local workforce boards, play a significant role in convening partners to identify, coordinate, direct, and support regional work-based learning solutions. Through WIOA, there are numerous examples of work-based learning models that eligible job seekers and youth may consider as part of their development and employment plan. Examples include paid work experiences, internships, and on-the-job learning. Likewise, companies benefit from a more work-ready talent pipeline through work-based learning models, such as incumbent worker, on-the-job, and apprenticeships. In our region, work-based learning models developed and customized to meet business needs and business learning preferences are the most requested methods for educating and upskilling workers. Two work-based learning models have been especially successful in the Shenandoah Valley, on the job and apprenticeships. Last year, the Workforce Board completed an on-the-job learning initiative focused on healthcare and advanced manufacturing. The Workforce Board convened economic development businesses, community colleges, technical centers, adjacent workforce boards, service providers, and community organizations to design and implement the initiative. 577 participants were placed into employment through on-the-job learning contracts with businesses. The registered apprenticeship work-based learning model is rooted in the need for companies to build their own skilled workforce in high-demand occupations. On-the-job mentoring provided by company experts and classroom theory are required elements of apprenticeship programs. By convening and working with regional partners, the Workforce Board acts as an intermediary to provide technical support and flexible designs to meet company needs. We are also fortunate to have a cooperative state apprenticeship agency that we work with to register apprentices. Apprentices receive classroom theory provided by an array of resources and selected by the company community college, technical school, online, vendor, and in-house subject matter expert are all supported methods of theory delivery. Participant uh, advancement through apprenticeship programs may be accelerated based on credit for prior work experience and based on competencies achieved. We are working with 75 companies, 19 are new apprenticeship sponsors, and 39 have added a new occupation. 552 new apprentices have been enrolled. Many are working toward industry certifications and occupations for manufacturing technician, electrician, machine operator, maintenance mechanic, and millwright. In addition to the traditional company-sponsored apprenticeship model, the Workforce Board is supporting several pre-apprenticeship models. One is an inclusive apprenticeship for individuals with disabilities. This initiative partners closely with Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center to deliver a manufacturing technician program with a residential 16-week curriculum. In addition to core classes, industry speakers and manufacturing plant tours increase student awareness of manufacturing environments. This is an excellent opportunity for interagency partnering and the establishment of cross-program braided funding. The first graduate of the program was hired by the Hershey Company. Once convinced of the apprenticeship model for production operators, the Hershey Company now has 53 industrial manufacturing technician apprentices. Another pre-apprenticeship model that we are piloting is a manufacturing production boot camp, a two-week intensive program for potential hires designed to increase the pipeline of production operators and improve retention of new hires. The boot camp is focused on recent high school graduates. The first week of the customized program includes the basics of being a production operative. To improve retention, workforce readiness is part of the boot camp. The second week is on site at the plant, providing hands-on experience. These are examples of work-based learning models with an emphasis on registered apprenticeships. Please remember there is no perfect upskilling model to meet the needs of every company for every occupation for every workforce development need. 
Therefore, the Workforce Board and our two regional integrated business services teams are always looking for new work-based learning models to meet the talent pipeline needs of businesses. We are anxious to learn more about the new industry-recognized apprenticeship program, IRAP, and how we can implement the new model in the Shenandoah Valley. The Workforce Board and our regional integrated business services teams are always looking for additional tools and services uh, to serve our businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony. Now, Ms. Reynolds, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Chairman Guthrie, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee, I'm honored for the opportunity to testify you before today in this important hearing on the job rebuilding the workforce through apprenticeships. As you know, my name is Carol Reynolds. I own the United Industrial Services. It's a small cert certified woman-owned electrical contracting business based in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm here today also on behalf of the independent electrical contractors, as well as the IAC Kentucky and Southern Indiana chapter, also located in Louisville. Based in Alexandria, Virginia, the IEC is an association of over 50 affiliates and training centers representing over 2,300 electrical and systems contractors nationwide. IEC's membership consists primarily of small businesses, with the average contractor member having 30 employees, 20 of which are electricians. IEC's purpose is to establish a competitive environment for the Merit Shop, a philosophy that promotes free enterprise, open competition, and economic opportunity for all. IEC and its training centers conduct apprenticeship training programs under the standards approved by the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Apprenticeship. Collectively, in 2018-19 school year, IEC will graduate more than 11,000 electrical apprentices nationwide. For decades, IEC has been at the forefront of the industry, providing highly skilled electricians through its registered apprentice program. An IEC apprentice can earn while they learn, incur little or no debt, and graduates with a lifelong, well-paying career. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the median salary for an electrician in 2017 was $54,110. As you're probably aware, electrical contractors, like the rest of the construction industry, continue to struggle to find qualified candidates to fill openings all across the country. Many factors have contributed to the current workforce shortages in this industry. The cultural shift in the country over the past few decades is an excellent example. A significant emphasis has been placed on young people to obtain a bachelor's degree, and a career in trades is rarely discussed as an option. Parents have grown to believe that the only pathway to success in the American dream is through a traditional college education. Not helping matters is that many school systems rate the success of their high schools on the number of students that attend college. In these areas, guidance counselors and school officials have absolutely no incentive to suggest their students consider entering an apprenticeship program like the IECs. This, along with enormous subsidies from the government in the form of student loans, has made it easier for students to pay for college without fully understanding the massive debt that they're encouraged incurring without a guarantee of a job to pay it off. Another factor contributing to the construction industry's shortage is the lack of exposure of young people to skilled trades as a viable career path. Across the country, we've seen less investment in vocational, career readiness, and technical education programs in high schools. These pro programs offer students an opportunity to realize there are career paths available that don't require attending college. They begin to understand the purpose of math and science. And with hands-on programs, they could influence their post-secondary education decisions. These programs will also help students build their soft skills. Many young people don't understand the importance of being punctual, communicating effectively, and behaving professionally in a work setting. In the Louisville area, we're excited to see high school programs like the one in Jefferson County moving to a system that exposes students to all possible career options, including careers in construction. In addition, my chapter works with the, Corps, the Job Corps and Fort Knox to help place veterans looking for opportunities in the private sector. Most of IEC's apprenticeship programs are approved training providers under the GI Bill. Lastly, IEC National recently launched MyElectricalCareer.com, which promotes electrical careers to young people through sites like Facebook and Pandora. When it comes to finding qualified individuals to become IEC apprentices through government programs such as the WIOA that has been mentioned, the IEC members have reported mixed results at best. My chapter and its members excuse me, have seen little to no uh, benefit from it. Other chapters have reported some success. Um, however, they ch the chapters have expressed the frustration with how time intensive it is, confusing, and bureaucratic the program is, making them less likely to use it in the future. The lack of qualified talent entering this industry has hurt the electrical contractor's ability to expand their operations. I es estimate that I'd be able to grow my com company easily by 50%, but as it is, I'm turning work away on a regular basis due to the lack of qualified people. 
By virtue of recent hearings like, like today, IEC remains optimistic that legislators are becoming more interested in developing public policy that will further assist the skilled trades to close the skills gap and increase the number of men and women in the skilled trades community. In closing, I want to express the IEC's willingness to work with Congress and the Trump administration to find practical solutions to address the workforce shortage faced by merit shop, electrical contractors, and the construction industry as a whole. Thank you for this opportunity to today explain the labor challenges the IEC continues to address, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Kis Kisnick, you are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Good morning. My name is Mark Kisnick, and it is my pleasure to serve as the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Wisconsin Regional Training Partnership Big Step. First and foremost, on behalf of myself and our, our whole board of directors, I want to ex extend my appreciation to the committee for the opportunity to share our experience and expertise uh, related to apprenticeship and workforce development. WRTP is widely recognized across the country as a leading industry-driven nonprofit workforce intermediary. Uh, our, we're dedicated to connecting people to family-sustaining jobs. Our mission, in short, is to enhance the ability of public and private sector organizations to recruit, develop, and retain a more diverse, qualified, and skilled workforce in the construction, manufacturing, and utility industries. Being industry-led, worker-centered, and community-focused, WRTP helps underemployed, underserved, and underrepresented individuals across Wisconsin succeed in well-paying careers while exceeding industry's workforce needs. Over the last 20 years of my engagement in workforce development, I've seen an evolution toward a more demand-driven system, and in part through a renewed focus in recent years on registered apprenticeship. Unfortunately, public investment has not met the tremendous demand in our communities. It is incumbent upon policymakers to drive resources to innovations and practices that offer high wages, benefits, and a clear pathway. Expanding registered, registered apprenticeship, supporting an infrastructure of local partnerships between workforce development systems, local partners, education providers, and community-based organizations, and strong federal investment in workforce and education are crucial to meeting business demand and workers' needs. While the primary focus of our organization is to ensure industries have skilled and prepared workforce uh, needed to, to create today's economy, we also have to ensure that citizens have access to and confidence in a workforce development system that delivers education and training to pathways that ensure economic success and ultimately independence. Registered apprenticeship for us combines the key elements to securing both objectives. One, that there's clear wage progression and career advancement that there's standard skills and certifications that are portable and recognized within industry, not just amongst an individual employer, that there's integration and recognition of competency and time-based in terms of gaining the skills, attainment, and excellence needed to be successful, that there is related technical and education instruction, and that without that, you're not gonna enhance the complete structured workplace learning experience. And lastly, and most importantly from our perspective, that there's local guidance from industry experts rep representing both workers and management. Not all workers are prepared to enter a registered apprenticeship system without additional training, however. It can take many years to prepare an individual to even reach uh, <laughs> the high standards required to enter a registered apprenticeship system and program. To address this, our organization works with industry partners and the workforce system and other community groups to not only identify workers and businesses needs, but to develop bridge programs that allow us to bridge that demand. Working with labor unions, employers, and contractors, and industry associations enables us to predict and align the programs we offer with employment and career opportunities in the communities we serve. This means we can better inform and align funding and create partnerships with government agencies, the workforce, uh, the public workforce and education systems, as well as organize the power and skill of our communities to better serve our constituencies. To put it in perspective, between 2016 and 2017, we placed over 1,600 individuals into employment at an average wage of 22.54. And most of the individuals who are coming into our programs are either unemployed, highly underemployed, and as a, and as a basis, about 30% of our participants have an average income of $3,000 a year or less, meaning most folks are unemployed. 
going to wrap up with a couple of points. We utilize both the MC3 curriculum, which is the National Building Trades Pre-Apprenticeship uh, curriculum. It's linked to registered apprenticeship, which makes it effective. Intermediary structures like WRTP have also been instrumental in creating the Industrial Manufacturing Technician Apprenticeship Program, which is one of the most widely uh, expanding and uh, diverse apprenticeship programs in the country. And lastly, I want to reference our partnership with the Workforce Development Boards. Through the Midwest Urban Strategies Consortium, we're working with 13 boards across the country. We're all working on scaling and replicating innovative practices in workforce development, and particularly around registered apprenticeship. I'll leave you with three points or four points that we've seen. We know that when local and state boards dedicate funding for industry partnerships and intermediaries that enhance and expand pre-apprenticeship that are linked to registered apprenticeship and, and that increase the engagement of industry, including both labor and employers, that we get effective programming and successful uh, strategies for connecting workers to business. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it. And uh, now recognize Mr. Dernbach. You're recognized for five minutes for your, your opening statement. Chairman Guthrie, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today about how Wisconsin's used our youth and registered apprenticeship models to address our workforce needs in the state. Right now, Wisconsin's economy is the best it's been in recent history. The unemployment rate's at 2.9% and has remained under 3% for the last six months. Our unemployment insurance claims continue to remain at historic lows, with initial claims ending in 2017 at their lowest level in over 30 years. While this is great news for the state of Wisconsin, it's posing challenges for companies to open positions, with open positions. It is imperative that we find enough qualified workers to meet the needs of our employers. That's why the department's mission has always been to get individuals, no matter their talent level or employment history, off the sidelines and into gainful employment. One of the most effective tools in our toolbox to get people into careers and get them a lifelong credential is the state of Wisconsin's registered apprenticeship program. In 1911, Wisconsin created the first registered apprenticeship program in the United States. That first year, we had 625 apprentices sign up. Fast forwarding to today, Wisconsin has nearly 11,000 registered apprentices with over 2,500 employers. Currently, we have over 200 different types of occupations active in the state. And just last week, I, have, I attended two new events to create, for the creation of registered apprenticeship programs. The first was an organic farming program over at the free, uh, historic Frank Lloyd Wright Harm Homestead. The second was for an information technology help desk position over at footlocker.com headquartered in Wausau, Wisconsin. Apprenticeship education has proven to be a great value for both employers and employees. The annual median salary for somebody in Wisconsin who completes an apprenticeship program is nearly $70,000. In addition, two years after completion of the program, 98% of those apprentices that graduate are still working in that same occupation and nearly 94% are staying in the state of Wisconsin. With bipartisan support, Governor Walker and the legislature continue to expand this program. In addition to receiving state general purpose revenue, our agency has received US DOL funding through the American Apprenticeship Grant and the State Expansion Grant, both of which are being used to expand apprenticeship in Wisconsin into new areas such as healthcare and information technology. Another key to our success is we work closely with an Apprenticeship Advisory Council, a 13-member stakeholder group of management and labor that provides guidance to the state of Wisconsin and the Wisconsin Tech college system on matters related to enactment of the laws, rules, and standards. We've had this council for over, since 1930. One of the other areas which Wisconsin has been focusing on is expanding our youth apprenticeship program. Wisconsin's youth apprenticeship program started in 1991 as part of a statewide school to work initiative. It provides high school seniors and juniors an opportunity to explore career options and gain skills while earning a wage while working while going to school. During the last school year, the state announced a record investment in the program. We had over 4,200 youth apprentices in, this, in the program with over 3,000 Wisconsin employers. The total earnings of all those youth apprentices last year while they were working and in school, $19 million. There were 11 different fields of study that students could go into from agriculture, natural resources, finance, health sciences, marketing, and information technology. And one of the big pushes in Wisconsin, over 40% of those youth apprentices were female. To leverage the youth and registered apprenticeship programs, We've also created a career pathway bridge to bridge the gap between youth apprenticeship and apprenticeship. That bridge concept provides a seamless transition for high school students into registered apprenticeship and gainful employment. Currently, we have 10 crosswalks developed in the manufacturing and construction sectors with more under development. 
That means the hours that a youth apprenticeship is in school, those credits will actually go towards their apprenticeship, their registered apprenticeship program. Meaning that in some cases, a youth apprentice can save up to one year of their registered apprenticeship program. Additionally, Governor Walker recently announced $20 million for a career creator plan. One of the components of that plan is a pilot program to help expand that youth apprenticeship pile beyond juniors and seniors in high school and get it down to the middle school through 10th grade level. In summary, Governor Walker and the Wisconsin Department of Workforce Development believe strongly that registered and youth apprenticeship play a vital role in keeping our workforce strong and prepare for the future needs of capable and innovative workers. Thank you members of the committee for this opportunity to speak and to talk about our success stories. Thank you very much, and that concludes our, our witness testimony, and we'll move to questions. Uh, before I do, I see Mr. Byrne is here with all the news going on, different news. I don't think a lot of us realize, I didn't, that your hometown is being hit with a major storm, as I saw last night and this morning. So I hope everything's going well with fair hope in your community. So you're in our thoughts and prayers. And it appears it's not going to be as bad as they thought. So we hope so that you're, everything's well. I'm going to first recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, Dr. Fox. You were recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairman Guthrie. I appreciate that. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Um, as some of you have noted, this is a, a topic of great interest to all of us on the committee, and we appreciate the insights that you bring to us. Um, Mr. Dernbeck, um, thank you for the comments you made, bringing us up to date with the good news from Wisconsin. As the Department of Labor works to establish a new industry-recognized apprenticeship program, what advice would you have to ensure the credentials awarded are valued by employers? I think the first thing they need to do is, you know, what we're finding in the state of Wisconsin is there's no one model that's appropriate for all types of businesses. Um, in Wisconsin, you know, a business may just need a 12-week boot camp, and we have a, a program in Wisconsin to go through that, or we could go into a registered apprenticeship program, or an employer could do a, uh, an employer-based apprenticeship program. The one advice I would have for the department is to make sure that, you know, in Wisconsin, one of our big goals is credentialing and to making sure there's portable credentials. So that if there is an industry-led apprenticeship or on-the-job program, that somehow we work with the existing structures to make sure that for the employee, there's some type of bridge to make sure that, you know, if they get a credential from the employer, that there's a bridge into the registered apprenticeship program in case something were to happen, because we want to make sure to preserve that economic investment that a, a company has made into that employee because we want to make sure that they're valuable for the state of Wisconsin going forward as well. Thank you very much. I noticed uh, that in your comments, you changed from your prepared comments to using that dreaded T word to education, and I want to compliment you on that. Um, <laughs> uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, at a time when we have more than six million unfilled jobs, there's no better time to help the long-term unemployed, underemployed, and dislocated workers succeed in transitioning to in-demand full-time employment. What are the practices you have found to be most effective in helping these individuals transition to more fulfilling careers, and what advice do you have for other workforce development boards when it comes to implementing these strategies? I think that one thing that we have learned is with the low unemployment rates right now, those individuals that remain unemployed, as you talked about the underemployed and the long-term unemployed, those individuals need a lot. They come from a lower point and they need a tremendous amount of support to build them up. And there is no one silver bullet or one way to do that. You have to take a look at the individual where they are and work with them from that point forward and have a plan and the supports in place to advance them into a full-time employment or other employment. Uh, we, we right now have a situation where we have youth, out of school youth, and again, because of the low unemployment rates, these individuals have jobs, so they don't need the WIOA required work experience because they have a job. They know they don't want that job forever, and they're looking for training, they're looking for skilling, upskilling, to get them into a career pathway and advancing in that pathway. So we're finding that the needs have to be, uh, the solutions have to be customized to the individual where they are and where they want to be and the supports there to get them there. Thank you. 
Ms. Reynolds, um, in your uh, remarks, you mentioned that um, you, you have some frustration with how time intensive, confusing, and bureaucratic some of the programs are, making them less likely to utilize we owe in the future. We don't have time during this hearing to get your detailed suggestions, but one of the best reasons for having these hearings is not only to hear what are the good things that are going on, uh, but also to get suggestions on how we can improve um, the uh, programs that we already have. So the staff and I would like to talk with you and get your specific suggestions on what can be done to reduce the bureaucracy and, and make the programs that we have out there work better for those of you attempting to implement them. And I, I would say, given your comments about electricians, as much as we're relying on electricity these days, I can only imagine the increased demand um, that's going to be out there for people with those skills. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chairwoman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the ranking member, Ms. Davis from California, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Kesnick, if I could ask you first, you talk about an, an intermediary, which is basically the, the role that you're playing. Could you speak a little bit more about that role as it is a recruiter for young people and some of the challenges that you've seen? So our organization, uh, we, we are governed in a structure that we have both labor and management from industry who govern our nonprofit organization. And our sole focus is really to be able to respond to industry demand. And so what that really means for our industry leaders, whether they're on the labor side or they own a company or they're an association, is have a single point of contact who can speak the United Nations of Languages, which is workforce boards, technical colleges, community organizations, faith-based organizations, individual calls, so we really, we really understand the demand side so that we can communicate effectively with all the other parts of the system. Because the bottom line is people don't want training programs and education. What they want is access to a career and they want access to a family you know, sustaining lifestyle. So what we try to do is then align programs and build programs that are just in time, meet industry demand, and really link people to those, to those bigger aspirations. How, how do you see scaling that notion? Well, we what have, has to take place to do that? Well, <laughs> well, investment is critical to that, clearly. Um, there's, been some, there's been some great efforts over the years through WIA and now through WIOA to put that notion forward, but it requires a couple things. I think a dedicated source of funding for industry partnerships that are really built on this intermediary model notion. I think it requires the partners who are at the table to be at the table in an invested and committed way, and that means uh, both industry as well as the education and workforce system. But it also means there needs to be a sustained commitment to that type of a structure. We don't need more boutique programs that you know, pose the solution and ultimately go away once some funding disappears. So you have to have an entity that can align different sources of funding for ourselves. That includes mm -hmm. we have public investment, federal, state, local, <coughs> We have private philanthropy that invests, and most importantly, our backbone is our industry actually puts money on the table. So as my yeah. board chair will say, they have skin in the game. Uh -huh. What do you say then to businesses that feel, it's just too much trouble? You know, I'm gonna try and do something that, that is sort of outside this process. Well, I, th I think one of the solutions here is this is not one employer's problem or one labor union problem or one community college problem. So we take an industry-wide look. So businesses have to come to the table and see both their individual need as well as their civic responsibility to be engaged in developing the workforce, whether it's through the K-12 system, through the technical community college system, or helping people re-enter yeah. from a Can you, I'm sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you a little bit just because we have limited time. So the federal role then, how, how do you see that playing out? What's important about that? Well, I think, I think first and foremost, you know, WIOA investment and direction toward intermediary structures and building capacity is critical. We'd love to see more competitive grant programs put out that really support those innovative models that deliver results, whether it's through H-1B dollars. And really recognizing that TANF and, and FSET programs are also key to getting the workforce challenges ahead and streamlined. 
Yeah, thank you. I appreciate your, your testimony. Um, Mr. Dermack, could you talk a little bit more about some of the pre-apprenticeship programs that you're looking at? You mentioned middle school. That's like music to my ears. Uh, that, in fact, we need to start earlier. But how does that link in to partly the registration, registered apprenticeship process? And what do you see is needed in order to educate our counselors, our teachers, that these kinds of possibilities for young people exist. How, how do you see that? I think what we're, what we're working at the state of Wisconsin is the sooner we can get students engaged in academic and career planning and career cruising, the better that, you know, it's all about them having the access to the knowledge, knowing what's available. So actually, we've been spending a lot of time, um, to your question about school counselors, letting them know, getting them access to labor market data. So you could have a school counselor up in northern Wisconsin, it could be a very different conversation with a student than maybe, say, down in Milwaukee. So we get them the labor market information saying, here are the hot jobs in your area, here are the skills. And then what we need to do is engage with the local businesses to get the local businesses engaged in the local educational systems so they can make those partnerships. And then once those partnerships exist, the students can go get an internship, they can go get a youth apprenticeship program in there. Once they're in youth apprenticeship, what we've done is actually with our registered apprenticeship program, figure out we've skilled match to say, you know, if you're going youth apprenticeship, you have these essential skills. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's already part of the apprenticeship program. So essentially they're getting dual credits for both programs. So not only are they earning while they're learning, they're also saving time and getting a step ahead of their peers. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Look more at it. Thanks. Thank you. The ranking member yields back and I'll recognize myself for five minutes for questions. And so first one for Dr. Johnson. How has WIOA supported the work of your Workforce Development Board in building successful work-based learning programs throughout your region? Uh, I believe the main way it has is the flexibility in WIOA that did not necessarily exist before and the true eye for innovation that comes with the flexibility that's allowed us to be able to work with companies uh, and customize programs for them. So the, the fle flexibility helps a whole lot uh, to be able to move funding around from dislocated worker to adult, from adult to dislocated worker, to work with a higher percentage of uh, out of school youth, but also with still within school youth if you want, if you choose to do so. So I think that, uh, that WIOA has helped with the flexibility and we always appreciate the flexibility so that we can adapt and adjust to what the regional needs are of the businesses in the community. Thank you very much. And I want to ask these questions to Ms. Reynolds. Uh, I was, like I said, home in August and, and went to a lot of business sites and everybody's in the situation appears to be you're in. I know it's not 100% in every region of the Commonwealth, but in most areas that people are struggling to find uh, skilled workers. And, and so the efforts that you're doing and we're all trying to do here, I think, it's this, I think all of us probably heard that in our districts. Uh, but in your testimony, you describe your participation in the Registered Apprenticeship College Consortium. Can you tell me a little more about this partnership and why it is successful? Well, the, I, I know very little of it, but what I do know of it is that um, there are colleges that are willing to work with the IEC's apprenticeship program, and if the student is willing, that they, will, they can get up to 40 hours of college credit by attending the apprenticeship program of the IEC. Then they can obviously come to a bachelor's or associate degree very, very simply and, and get the degree as well as the hands-on job training. So it's, a, it's kind of double crediting the whole time. Um, in the beginning, when this first got started, um, there weren't a lot of people that were pursuing it, but it's been, been put out there more, and we've seen in the last three or four years quite a bit of an increase nationally in the participation of the program. Thank you. Um, I worked at a family business before coming here, a foundry, and, and most of our managers, supervisors, people in production, particularly leaders in production, supervisors, managers, salary people, with the well, plant manager being one, were moved up through, they showed up, and we had training and skills programs and moved up kind of through the system. And I know your company does the same because you have to develop the skills because you don't have access to them from outside. Um, so how do individuals in your company advance their career development? If, a, if an apprentice learns one goal, one skill, and then desires to learn additional skills, are there avenues for them to do others? There are. We're, my, my particular business is mechanical and, and electrical. Um, and so if I've got a, a young apprentice that's in, say, first or second year, and he's just really achieving everything he, that the apprenticeship program can give but wants more, um, we'll move him into more difficult things. We'll teach him to weld. We'll teach him to be, you know, millwright uh, skill sets and that sort of thing so they can be an all-around electrician, if you will, because a lot of things have to be attached in, in, in the ceiling or whatever and, and 
if they want to become certified in it, that's great. If they just want to learn the basics, that's fine too. Um, but anything that, because I've got all those skill sets within my company, anything that a, a, a young person gravitates toward, we just grab it and teach them everything that they want to learn about it so that, that they are fully rounded uh, craftsmen. Thanks, and that's what we try to do. And, and one of the objectives the, with Ms. Davis and I's bill is something I'm looking forward because we did the same thing. We couldn't find enough tool and die makers, so we had to kind of create our own. And so we have tool and die makers that we call tool and die makers in our factory, paid like tool and die makers, because they can do anything a tool and die maker could do in our factory, but they're but it's just internal to us and they're not credentialed to maybe do other skills that a tool and die maker may have to do if you have the full journeyman tool and die maker program. That in industrial maintenance, all the others. And so what I'd like to see is that companies can get their employees into these credentials that are portable. Yes. Of course, it makes it more advantageous for somebody to hire somebody away from your company if you have a portable skill, but that's that's the marketplace. And, and it, it, it benefits is. them. It benefits you for having somebody going through that program while they're working for you, and you either up the ante and keep them, or they have an opportunity to improve themselves in the marketplace. And so that's one thing that we're looking forward to. And, and, and another thing that I heard, and I have about instead of another question about 20 seconds is what I editorialized when I was home is why can't people find avenues to work together in Washington, D.C.? And I will tell you there are big issues that we debate and we are passionate about both sides uh, and, and those are big issues and it's important and it's appropriate to do that but there are a lot of things we all just agree on and in those areas we do work together and we do try to make things happen and I guess I'm still trying to get a waiting on a phone call from a cable news network saying why don't you come on TV tonight and talk about how well you work together on these issues and that's just not what happens but I will finish editorializing and yield back and I will now recognize another good friend of mine from the state of Connecticut Mr. Court for five minutes. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for uh, to all the witnesses for talking about really which is the issue of the day. There isn't a district uh, in the Congress where the skills gap and uh, again, the struggle to, to uh, fill really good paying jobs uh, doesn't exist. So again, this, this topic is uh, really universal uh, to, to really every part of the country. Um, in terms of trying to decipher, you know, what the what the issue is here, though, I mean, they're, they're clearly, um, you know, and it's been alluded to uh, in some of the testimony about the fact that um, the administration has unveiled a new apprenticeship program that will allow the federal dollars to flow to essentially unregistered apprenticeship programs. Uh, the registration process, which goes back to 1937, the Fitzgerald Act, um, provides a national standard for apprenticeship programs. It establishes labor standards like a wage scale and anti-discrimination provisions. I am concerned that this uh, uh, unregistered uh, approach is, is really gonna uh, undercut a proven model. So, uh, Mr. Kucinich, I, I wanna ask you, can you speak to the importance of the registered apprenticeship model and the quality standards that registration establishes? Well, clearly, the, one of the, 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 the best ways to market um, this to individuals who are looking to build a career is to, is to be able to articulate that there is a pathway toward a family sustaining career and you're going to get that through the support of a registered apprenticeship program that there is clear wage progression that there are skills that there are standards a lot of students or young people who have gone through different types of education and learning models end up either with a big bill on their tab or they end up with a piece of paper that doesn't really lend itself to getting them to the next job or the next stage in their career. So one thing the Registered Apprenticeship Program does, at least in the great state of Wisconsin, is it ensures that quality, that standard. And, and honestly, to make that decision to move forward into apprenticeship program is a big sacrifice and it's a big investment on the part of both the employer and the individual. So having that level of, of detail is necessary and, and quite honestly, to your point, one of the concerns that we would have with, with a non-registered apprenticeship system is what is that commitment to diversity and helping individuals who are returning from incarceration, women, get into the skilled trades, not only in the manufacturing and construction sectors, which we care about, but I'm you know, a citizen too, so I care about all other sectors of the economy as well. So we wanna be able to promote, and register apprenticeship gives us a platform to really discuss that on. Well, thank you. I mean, I think um, you know, that really gets to the crux of, of this sort of, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it dispute, but certainly conversation about just you know, what is the best model. Um, you know, there's a narrative that, that the Fitzgerald Act is cumbersome and unworkable. Again, I enjoyed listening to Mr. Dernbach's uh, description of, uh, you know, the, the registered apprenticeship program for an organic farm and for information technology. We're seeing that in Connecticut. Uh, uh, the Hartford Insurance Group actually used the registered apprenticeship program, which was really sort of outside of 
what I think a lot of people saw uh, an insurance company's uh, wheelhouse was, uh, and they found it to be an extremely workable program with the, the State Department of Labor. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter a letter that I got from a, a small manufacturer in eastern Connecticut, Collins and Jewel, which sort of describes this sort of, uh, you know, dynamic in terms of, uh, you know, new employers entering into the apprenticeship program with some trepidation and what, what uh, their experience was. Um, and i just read really uh, briefly. We at first were very reluctant to get enrolled into the apprenticeship program as we were under the misconception that apprenticeship was a very difficult process for small employers. Once approached about the program, we were surprisingly relieved that the process was not nearly as daunting as imagined and we could utilize our current job descriptions to create a training program that included on the job with classroom training and thus within a few months we had an approved apprenticeship program and had five employees enrolled. So I'd ask that that uh, Without objection, be so, ordered. so So again, you know, the notion that, um, you know, this is a, a program that needed fixing, um, you know, I, I, everywhere I see, um, you know, when, when people actually engage with the Department of Labor and see how user-friendly it is, um, you know, the results are, are quite good. And, you know, I would just note that, I mean, obviously we're talking about a scaling up situation. The chairman mentioned six million uh, job openings around the country. But frankly, our country has faced those situations in the past. And, and, and after the Fitzgerald Act was passed, the biggest scaling up in our economy's history was obviously World War II. Um, and, uh, we were able to, uh, again, meet the, the challenge in terms of in industry-wide mobilization across the country using a registered apprenticeship uh, model that actually gave people a, a, a certificate of value at workers that they could actually transfer to, to different sectors and, and different uh, parts of the country. So, uh, again, I want to thank the chairman for, for uh, holding this hearing, but I, I really feel that um, we should be very vigilant in this committee to make sure that we're not eroding standards that employers have found they can use and also that uh, obviously benefit the employees that go through the process. I yield back. Uh, gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Stefanik, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses who are here today to discuss this critical topic. In my two terms in Congress, I've visited hundreds of small businesses, manufacturers, and like many of my colleagues here today, I cons consistently hear of their concern uh, in being able to fill skilled jobs. Um, and this committee has done great bipartisan work, whether it was the CTE reform package we passed or Congress as a whole increasing funding for WIOA. But what I find is that much of the uh, innovative efforts and much of the innovation happens at the local level. An example in my district is the Advanced Manufacturing Institute, where the manufacturers and our local businesses community came together with the higher education community and said, we need to ensure that we have a pipeline to fill these high-skilled jobs. It has been a success. It has buy-in from the community. I also think about our BOCES programs, our CV Tech, our P Tech programs. There's a lot of innovation, as I said, happening at the state and local level. My question for you is, what are the challenges uh, from making sure that there's flexibility for local communities to come forward with innovative solutions regarding how we can close this skills gap? Mr. Ms. Reynolds? Um, the issue that I have personally, I, again, I only know about electrical contractors. I don't know about any other um, apprenticeship programs. The issue I have, the IEC uh, is a, a, a registered apprentice program. It's an excellent program. It's, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's, it's user-friendly. It's well-priced, all of that. The challenge that I have is, is getting people that, that can go there and be successful. Um, and, and I'm sure it's just the state of Kentucky, but these children are coming out of high school with low skills. They, they, you know, to be an electrician, you have to have a pretty high level of math ability. And the, uh, the uh, National Electrical Code book is written at a uh, freshman in college uh, level. And these kids are coming out, they, don't understand, they can't read the code book. They can't, they, so we have to tutor them to know their, to the skills that they should have gotten when they were in school. Um, then, then you add to it that no one was, you know, was shown that you could be a, a contractor, you could be an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, until they're at a job fair when they've just graduated high school. 
they've so already earlier, made decisions. Understanding earlier on yes. in the educational system the importance of skills and potential exactly. economic and employment opportunities oh, yeah. after graduation. Very, very much so. And, it, and it's at, I'm, I participate in the Skills USA. It is in Louisville. It's been mm -hmm. about two more years. The IEC hosts it, and it's every skilled trade that there is. There's, there's a, you name it, and, and it is there. And it, there's a lot of children that are well, young people. I shouldn't say children that are that are involved with that. And we need to take that model that they've got and just put it into the public school system so that, that everyone gets the chance to see what they could be if they wanted to be. Don't just put them in a pathway that is not necessary. You know, we, we're not cookie cutter people. We need to be people that make them be individualized and what, what draws them to something, who knows. But if they don't ever see it, they won't be drawn to it. And I think you made an interesting point in your opening remarks, Ms. Reynolds, when you talked about how we oftentimes grade or rank our schools on the percentage of students that go to a traditional four-year college. And right. that may not be the best report card when we are trying to promote skills and vocational educational opportunities. Um, another question I had, my district is a very rural district. Do you see unique challenges, and this is for the whole panel, on workforce development programs in rural communities across the country? I would like to address that as well. Um, yes, we're primarily rural, and we are finding that the way that you conduct outreach about the services that you have to offer and the initiatives, the programs that you have to offer, needs to be addressed in a different way. You need to, in it's the, the most rural communities, connect with those that are already leaders and champions in those communities and work with them to support them your missions align and, and your, your work is complementing each other to get into that community and to actually provide those services and not come from the outside. Uh, so the, the outreach, we're also looking at moving away from more of the bricks and mortar to have them have, get transportation into where our centers are to finding out other ways to get to them. For example, when we look at our numbers for the year ending in June, we have the, the uh, we're in the uh, 20, the lowest 20% for traffic in our centers, but we're in the highest 20% for serving adults and dislocated workers, and we're in the highest 20% in our state for serving youth. So we're finding that if you meet them at the McDonald's or the Walmart or the library or the church, that you have a better chance of actually getting to them to serve them. Thank you for that, my time has expired. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full, full committee, Mr. Scott from Virginia, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've often said that we need to legislate based on an evidence-based policy, and that's what we did with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. We all, we all was built an evidence-based policy, and it encourages workforce development systems to engage participants in on-the-job training and registered apprenticeships. We know based on that evidence that registered apprenticeships have been proven uh, to be an effective method of getting workers into good paying jobs. In a deviation from that model, the Department of Labor will now certify third parties to approve apprenticeship programs without DOL oversight. It's unclear how these new industry recognized apprenticeship programs, the IRAP, will maintain and enforce quality standards, it's especially concerning since the House Labor HHS Appropriations Bill will, for the first time, allow federal funds to be directed to non-registered apprenticeships. So I hope, Mr. Chair, we can invite the Department of Labor to explain uh, before this committee uh, how their plans uh, will actually work in establishing non-registered apprenticeship programs so that we can find a bipartisan path going forward. Let me start with Mr. Uh, Kucinich. Um, can you... Um, um, say a word about the value of an apprenticeship program being registered? Well, as an intermediary, our core function is to really connect demand to a skilled workforce. And so working with employers, their labor partners, we are able to put in place registered apprenticeship programs or help expand them um, in ways that, um, that sometimes the employers themselves aren't sure how to do. So we, we serve an important function. The IMT program, which is one of the the newly registered apprenticeship programs in the country, it's expanded across the country pretty rapidly. It's very much an employer-driven, innovative approach to their real-time workforce needs for their current workers and, their, and you know, kind of their new entering workers. So RA has turned out to be a 
very valuable program for, for those employers, for those workers. And we've got hundreds of success stories across the country now through that program where individual workers are seeing better wages, they feel more confident in their skills, they're able to move through industry through dislocations. So RA has proved to be a, a very effective strategy for them. Uh, could you tell us how you would maintain standards to guarantee that only quality programs would receive federal money if you don't have the registration as we now have? From my, from my perspective, I think that it's going to create confusion in the marketplace, if you will. There will be employers and businesses that we work with that, they, that don't use registered apprenticeship programs now that we've been trying to work with to get you know, situated you know, successful proven models. This is going to confuse the issue for many of them. Uh, many of them will struggle with starting something that they don't know how to sustain. And so the challenge for us is going to be how to clearly communicate what the expectations and standards are for a, for a bifurcated system. We, we support a lot of strategies, but this, this does confuse things at a time when we're having success. Well, if you don't have the, the registration under the normal process, is there any way to guarantee that the programs being set up would only receive money from the federal government if they are quality programs? We wouldn't have any, any way of controlling that or, or, or even um, monitoring or having information other than antidotal. Now, can you tell us, well, if you have a apprenticeship from a registered program, can you tell me the value of that as you go from state to state? Well, we, one, we have a clear understanding of how many apprentices are active, at what state in their activity they are in terms of if it's a one-year, two-year, three-year apprenticeship. We can track the diversity, the gender uh, outcomes on those pieces. We can track wages, we can track uh, long-term success in the marketplace. In Wisconsin, for sure, we have got a great data uh, tracking system, so we know where we need to work harder, and we know where there's other opportunities to improve. Um, I don't have a lot of knowledge beyond Wisconsin in terms of their specifics. But, but um, work, employers in other states would recognize what the worker could do if it's a registered program. Oh, absolutely. That's, what, that's the point of having a journey card, is that you can actually move from city to city, state to state, and your skills are recognized widely across the industry and the economy. Now you have a program, apparently, that uh, deals with giving uh, those with a felony conviction a second chance. Yes, ab about 75% of the individuals we see annually are coming either out of federal probation, state corrections, house corrections, so all of our programming is geared with the ideal of connecting people to demand. And so we try to mitigate people's backgrounds and try to give them the skills and competencies that they need to be successful. And that's what they sell themselves on, not selling themselves on necessarily returning. And so how successful have you been? We have about an 80 to 85 percent success rate overall in our organization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Lewis, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing and uh, this topic. I mean, this is something that is, I have to say, near and dear to my heart. I, I grew up um, in a small family business that was started out as a machine shop. So Ms. Reynolds, when you talk about wiring diagrams or the ability to w learn these mechanical trades, whether you're you know, cylinder boring or grinding a crankshaft or trying to read a wiring diagram, my dad was a uh, mechanical engineer by trade, but he could take out a wiring diagram and just go, here's the, here's the, this and this and this, and we're talking about 120 volt, 240 volt, and I'd be sitting there going, what'd you say, Dad? Uh, it, that is an amazing skill, and it is a skill, you mentioned uh, youth coming out of high school don't have, and yet we've got more job openings for those sorts of skills than we do people applying for them. Why aren't we training folks to that degree? So. I think everybody's on the same page here, and this is a very much a, a bipartisan effort when we talk about filling the six million unfilled jobs. We've got to focus on career and technical education, which we have uh, on this committee in a bipartisan way. We had a big stride forward with the Perkins Act. I had a dual enrollment amendment there. I was glad to get in the language of the bill. Expanding these work-based apprenticeship learning opportunities is obviously something that, that Congress has done in, in years gone by, and I want to I want to talk a little bit about that because I'm also very, very pleased to be working with Ranking Member Scott on a juvenile justice and criminal justice reform that would, would help uh, with these skills for people that have been um, 
you know, been, been out of the workforce for a while or within the uh, criminal justice system. I, I do want to bring that up, though, in regards to the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act. Um, right now, as I understand it, it requires about 75% of youth activities funded to go towards kids who have dropped out of school or been involved in the juvenile or adult justice uh, uh, system. My state of Minnesota is having some trouble and some challenges with that. They received a waiver recently from the DOL to get out from under that. So, Dr. Johnson, can you explain what your workforce board has done in attracting and connecting these sorts of out-of-school youth on work-based learning opportunities and whether it's been successful or not? Uh, that is an area that we have struggled with, too, as a local area. And the reason uh, that we have found in practicality is because of our low unemployment rate. The out-of-school youth that we are working with, they already have jobs. And what they want is to get out of those jobs, so they need, they need skills, upskill training, to go into another career pathway or to advance into a career pathway. Now, who, the, the individuals that we find, the youth that we find that do want the work experiences are the in-school youth. They don't as readily have them as the out-of-school youth. Uh, we, one thing that we looked at was we moved from all out of school to partially uh, in school. We are also uh, looking at recommending from our region that uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia looks at requesting that waiver to change that work experience. We are finding that we did not uh, meet the work experience requirement for out of school youth. It's a more difficult population to work with. They're very transient. Uh, it's hard to keep up with them. Uh, the best chance that we have had so far is to partner with other organizations that have a long successful history of working with out-of-school youth and trying to support their efforts and partnering in that way. I would open that up to the, uh, the rest of the panel as well on best practices to make certain we, we, we meet these requirements or perhaps um, take a look at them. I would like to speak to that. Sure. Um, I was just speaking on way over that um, you were talking about the people that have been in the criminal system and, and yep. getting out. Um, why could we owe money not build, like I'll, I'll say state institutions or federal prisons, whatever, a point to where when the prisoner is getting ready to be put back into society, two years before, three years before, whatever, that they, they can be trained in a skilled trade. They can, they, can, they can learn to be a carpenter while they're in prison. So as soon as they get out, not only do, do they have a, a way to transition, tradition, transition, I'm sorry, back into society, they'll have a purpose and the knowledge to do it. They can just step right into a job, start working, and stay out of trouble, if you will. Um, it's a good, it's a win-win for everybody. There's, they're, they're not going to go on any kind of federal um, welfare programs or whatever because they're going to be making a good living doing whatever it is we've trained them to do. And we are addressing that in this committee, not not only with the juvenile justice, but obviously with Perkins and obviously with this program. And obviously, we need to continue uh, to do that because these are the the 21st century jobs that are going to rebuild America. Thank you so much. Sure. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Ticano, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Kucinich, you mentioned in your testimony that, all, that all, not all workers are prepared to enter a registered apprenticeship and that it could even take uh, years to prepare individuals to reach a pre-apprentice level. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I find that interesting. Well, our organization runs a, a, a whole range of workforce development programming, everything from transitional employment programs to working with out-of-school youth who are, who are also transitioning to pre-apprenticeship programs. Our, our pre-apprenticeship programs are really designed to link an individual who's at that point in time with an opportunity in industry where there is a registered apprenticeship program, meaning it's a job and it's a commitment to ongoing learning. So we support a whole range of workforce development strategy but it does take time to get an individual who hasn't been successful at coming out of high school and they're, and they're still trying to figure it out. So, so there needs well, to be a range of services. Maybe walk us through an example of that. I mean, just uh, may, a lot of folks may not understand why it may take a long time to even get to the pre-apprenticeship level. Kind of give us an example of that. Sure. So uh, specifically, uh, we run a transitional employment program that takes about nine, it's about nine months. So we've, I've had individuals who have worked in a transitional employment scenario for nine months receiving training two times per month. That same individual then may gravitate into another manufacturing opportunity that we have with an employer and stay there six to eight months. 
Simultaneously, they may be in a tutoring program that we're getting them ready for an apprenticeship test that they're gonna have to pass to get in. So that process for some individuals takes two to three years. That's why we run programs, and we call them programs, as opposed to just operating uh, federal investments. So sometimes an individual may be supported at one point in the pathway through WIOA. Later in the pathway, it's through private or philanthropic investment. Sometimes it's through subsidized employment, but it takes a period of time and a commitment to that individual to get to their, to get them to their point of. of I, mean, I want to be open-minded about these, the, the New DOL proposal, the, these IRAPs, the individual, the industry recognized uh, apprenticeship program, but my sense is that they may not, some of these folks may not be fully understanding what uh, is involved in trying to get individuals uh, prepared. From the, from the individual perspective that we work with, job seekers are already struggling to figure out what credential means what. They're struggling to figure out how to get from point A to point B, how to, if I leave this job and I take this job, what will happen? So we're trying, we're trying organizationally to build as much sustainability and, and, um, and confidence. And so we support all kinds of industry credentials, um, but how they link to, to the long range is really what is the challenge. I really hope with future hearings we can dig into this more so that we really understand, quote unquote, the clientele we're working with and the, just the difficulty of it, um, the multifacetedness of it. Um, uh, well, you, how are their skills assessed? I mean, what are some of the assessments you use? Well, we use, we use two different methodologies. One, we use, we use kind of basic tape testing or, or math and reading level testing. And secondarily, we have a, we've developed a skills inventory, which is a one-on-one -on -one assessment of an individual's work experience, their social or personal scenario, and what their kind of skills or, or career aspirations are. And so through that combination, we not only track people at the enrollment of, uh, into our organization, but as they progress through the organization at different points, people come in, come back to us over the course of sometimes years, seeking the next step in the process. So that's one of the importances of having uh, intermediaries that have capacity, is that we're always there so that individuals can come back when they need, businesses can come back when they need. We're not just you know, flailing in the wind well, can intermediary programs like yours help our veteran population pursue registered uh, apprenticeships? Absolutely, we work with the VIP program or the Veterans and Piping program. We work with several of our, our veteran programs in Wisconsin that are helping individuals transition back into the workforce. Uh, so it's a critical part of our, our partnership. So you, have, you do have programs that are especially and specifically geared toward veterans? No, we don't dedicate any of our programs toward veterans, but we enroll veterans into many of our programs very specifically. So we work with a lot of organizations that that's their primary function is to really reach out to the veteran community and make sure they're connected to real meaningful uh, you know, employment opportunities that we can offer. Well, thank you very much. I yield back my uh, remaining time, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Smucker, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, appreciate uh, the hearing uh, on this subject. Uh, Ms. Reynolds is a former construction company owner uh, as well, had the uh, same issue over 25 years, really. Uh, the biggest problem we always faced was finding uh, qualified people or people to fill the roles who could be trained. Um, I do want to, uh, Mr. Uh, Dernbach, I am a fan of the apprenticeship model. Um, it's you know, just because of what it has to offer. Um, I think we're seeing today many shortages in not only construction and manufacturing, but in industries, uh, in many different industries. Uh, and I think the apprenticeship model, much as we uh, talk about it, continues to be underutilized, has a lot of potential. So I guess I'm asking you, um, you know, what are some of the biggest barriers that you see? How could we further utilize apprenticeship models? What could we do here at the federal level to encourage them? Um, in the state of Wisconsin, I think what we need to get women and minorities into the program as much as possible, and actually USDOL has been supporting that. So at the state of Wisconsin, we do a lot of our pre-apprenticeship and our youth apprenticeship targeted at females and uh, people with minorities to get them into the trades. Um, and the secondly, it's just you know getting people into apprenticeship, it's just an education. 
Um, we need, I think individuals need to understand that there is post-secondary education required in today's workforce, but post-secondary education doesn't necessarily mean a four-year degree. So we've been spending a lot of time working with school counselors to say, here are the jobs available. You know, in Wisconsin, they, you know, you go through a registered apprenticeship program, that salary is gonna be higher than some doctoral degrees in the state of Wisconsin. So we're trying to educate them, and that way the students have the knowledge saying, okay, now, hey, you know, you can go into this hot job in the state of Wisconsin. Now we can get you into a youth apprenticeship. Why don't you try it out while you're in school? Figure out what careers you're interested in. So that way when they come out of that tw uh, the 12 years of education, they know that career pathway they wanna go. Secondly, um, we want to engage buried populations as much as possible. Obviously, the, the talent pipeline in Wisconsin and all the other states is getting a lot smaller. So we're trying to really engage in the incarcerated populations, maybe people with disabilities, trying to get them off the sidelines and using our flexible WIOA dollars, which if I can put and plug in, those flexible WIOA dollars have been phenomenal for, I can speak Wisconsin and all the states. You know, we're able to put job centers inside correctional institutions. We're putting CNC fab labs inside a correctional institution to get people trained before they get out so they understand, okay, am I qualified for this? You know, can we transition them into pre-apprenticeship programs? So using those flexible dollars and getting people, those buried populations ready to go and into our workforce program as quickly as possible. Thank you. I, I agree that, um, uh, that um, continued education of students, uh, parents, guidance counselors about the opportunities that are available uh, in these fields is very important. I also think um, we could see more partnership with businesses and uh, institutions of education. In fact, I want to just briefly uh, tout a, a bill that I introduced, which is the USA Workforce Tax Credit Act, uh, which would help to encourage that investment by businesses by establishing a tax credit. Uh, for charitable contributions to support uh, community-based apprenticeship programs or other types of career and technical uh, training. So I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. Do you feel that a tax credit encouraging more investment by businesses uh, would, be, uh, would help to further uh, apprenticeship programs? I think the demand right now for businesses to engage in that K-12 pipeline is high, and anything we can encourage local businesses to get into there as much as possible is always welcomed. Um, I can tell you in the state of Wisconsin, employers now are engaging in the K-12 pipeline. They may not have six, seven years ago. They are today. We've got businesses screaming and saying, you know, I went to a business and they, they do furniture making and they say, we need employees. And I said, your high school is literally two blocks behind you. Have you engaged in youth apprenticeship? And they say, no, we haven't. I said, okay, so how do we create that pipeline for you? And I know with businesses, you know, exactly what type of education and training program they need varies. But you know, it's kind of sometimes those fundamental questions because businesses, a small business especially like yours, they may not have a, a robust human resources department, may not know about it. So anything we can do to get in front of them saying we can help create that pipeline, here's what we've learned and get that in front of them as much as possible, I think is what's gonna help drive the education system going forward. Thank you and uh, just a quick question uh, for um, Dr. Johnson. You mentioned the industry recognized apprenticeship program. I know I'm almost out of time, but. I'd like to hear from you what you think the potential is for that and how you would like to see that develop. Um, the reason that we're very interested in that is that it's another tool and another resource to work with businesses and that not every business can use the same, I think it's been mentioned here several times, the same solution does not fit every business or every, um, every need that a business has. So from a local perspective, we were looking at that as another tool, another resource to use that could be an option for the business because um, we like to lay out what, as we are working with a business time and time again and building that relationship, we like to let, listen to what their needs are and then lay out the appropriate tools that may be available and that may be uh, customized together to meet their solutions. So it would be another tool for us and that would be a positive. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognize, recognizes Ms. Blunt Rochester for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Davis, and uh, thank you to the panel. Um, this is a really good and important discussion for our country. Um, Mr. Kucinich, when you uh, spoke, you mentioned really ultimately this conversation is about careers and people being able to have the ability to support themselves and their families and to have a thriving life. And it's also about our business community and our economy and to ensure that we're still competitive and that we continue to be strong. And so this conversation is really important. Um, Ms. Reynolds, you mentioned a culture shift. And I think that's one of the key things that, that we hear is a challenge is 
people seeing themselves, the, the opportunity, whether it's a woman as a plumber, whether it's someone coming out of prison, to be able to see themselves in these jobs and that they're great paying jobs that will provide a, a good life for your family. Um, our governor, John Carney, who actually was a member of Congress, um, has just uh, launched, they will this month, a family-friendly construction career expo. They'll have food trucks, they'll have activities, hands-on, big trucks, you know, everything for young people as well as adults and opportunities for, for actual interviews. And so I think that kind of creativity, you talked about innovation, is really uh, one of the things that we need to start shifting the culture. Uh, the other thing that I love that you talked about, Mr. Dernbach, was um, the use of labor market information and that we really need to be targeting our resources, our time, our efforts to where the jobs are. And, and that, to me, is key. Um, I served as Secretary of Labor in Delaware, so I get very excited when people talk about data and um, labor market information. I, my question is really to, to the panel. Um, Ms. Reynolds talked about the perception, going back to culture shift and myths. Um, she talked about the, the perception that these apprenticeships are the, the are time intensive and bureaucratic, the, the, you know, coming out of labor. I, I'm curious from Mr. Kucinich, Dernbach, Johnson, you're all, also what you hear. Do you hear that same thing? What needs to change? Is it a perception or is it a reality? We'll start with Mr. Dernbach and work our way down. You know, and you're absolutely right. There are a lot of myths out there. I can tell you going about the state as well, you know, when we talk with students, they still perceive manufacturing as dumb, dirty, and dangerous. I can tell you, and, and members of Congress, you've all been to your local manufacturers. Those are some of the cleanest facilities yes. I've ever been in. So anything we can do to get into to get school, uh, school counselors to one, let them know that these jobs are different than they were 40 years ago. Secondly, you know the labor market data is extremely important, but also putting it in English as well is yes. the hardest thing. Yeah. Um, in the state of Wisconsin, the state actually, under Governor Walker, put a, a really big investment into making that labor market data in English. So when we work with our school counselors, we can say, you know, we've got skill sets. Here are the hot jobs. They can pull up a heat map available on our WISConnect web, our WISC economy website, and say, these are the skills. These are where the jobs are. These are the wages. Here's the pipeline on how you get there. And I think, you know, supporting labor market data and getting make sure that you know it's in English and getting people trained on how to use that is one of the best tools we can do. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Well, as an intermediary, one of the big things that we do with businesses is, is to help them implement their, their apprenticeship programs and their other you know, incumbent worker training programs because they don't have HR you know, staff to do it often. Sometimes they don't understand the details or implications of what they're actually implementing. So helping ease that transition, it goes from, it goes from a myth to, uh, to perception to, oh, it's not so bad. Gotcha. Um, on the other side, I think for job seekers, and I think it's been referenced, it has to be really clear because Individuals only kind of absorb so much information in one setting, so it, it's a, you have to have building blocks of understanding and confidence that those building blocks are, are, are very real. So that's why all of the steps toward registered apprenticeship are very, very important so that individuals have confidence to move a certain direction. I only have 49 seconds, so Ms. Johnson, I'll follow up with you afterwards, but I did want to thank you so much for your comment also about um, inclusion of people with disabilities in these programs, and I, my other question to you was going to be on b dispelling myths for people with disabilities, and I have a question for Mr. Kucinich as well about your programs, the average cost. One of the big moves that we talk a lot about in Congress is work requirements. And I think there's a misconception about how much time and money and effort it takes to move s some individuals, whether they need additional training from school, maybe they didn't get it, whether they're transitioning from prison or a veteran, um, so, and, and, or a person with disability. So Mr. Kucinich, I'll follow up with you in writing. And Ms. Johnson, Dr. Johnson, thank you so much. My time has run out. Thank you, panel. Thank you very much. I appreciate the gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Banks. From Indiana, five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to each of you for being here to testify about this important subject today. As has already been noted, the American economy is booming. Pro-growth policies have produced 4% GDP growth, unemployment is below 4%, and more jobs are available uh, than job seekers to fill them. But in Northeast Indiana, where I come from and where I represent, the story is even better. As of July 2018, unemployment is 3.2%, 0.2 percent, 
0.7 points lower than the national average. However, Northeast Indiana faces some of the same workforce challenges seen all over the country that many of you have addressed today. Each of the top industries in Northeast Indiana is confronting the need for skilled workers. For example, the manufacturing sector is projected to need 8,000 additional workers by 2025. 21% 21 of the workers in this sector are 55 years or older, but only 7.8% are younger than the age of 25. While we clearly need to confront this workforce challenge aggressively, we need to empower local leaders and businesses not spend more money at the federal level. That is why I'm pleased to see the Department of Labor taking the first steps toward recognizing apprenticeships not registered with the Department of Labor through the Industry Recognized Apprenticeship Program. Industry leaders know what skills are needed in their workers and Washington should not stand in the way of innovative apprenticeship programs just because they do not fit in a specific bureaucratic box. Uh, Ms. Reynolds, your testimony mentions the electrical contractors are facing some of the same problems that we're seeing in Northeast Indiana where I come from, with much of the skilled trades workforce at or approaching retirement. You mentioned that one of the problems is not enough young people are being exposed to skilled trades as a possible career path. Do you think that the proposed industry recognized apprenticeship program through reduced red, taped, red tape and streamlined access to federal support could expand the number of apprenticeships and increase exposure? I think it's possible. Um, I, and I've never been, a per, I don't look at money as the solution here. Um, in the old days, I, I went to school through the 70s, and at that point in time, there were several um, apprenticeship, high school apprenticeship programs throughout, I went to school in Louisville, Kentucky, and there was four or five different schools. And, and you, you could sign up for a school field trip, if you will, that, that they would bus you to your whatever was closest, um, and you got to go through the entire program. You get to see all the plumbers and the carpenters and the auto mechanics and the entire school, its facility, its teachers, how it worked, and you got to you get to, to actually physically see the building and, and talk with the teachers and talk with the students and have a career day um, to where you're being exposed to anything that these, these vocational programs do. That wouldn't cost much money at all. It's just a bus ride for, for 69 children at a time that could just go to these vocational programs if, in fact, the state has those programs. In, in, in Kentucky, we've helped, the IEC has helped with three different, um, now four counties that are starting back into uh, high school apprenticeship programs. Um, and we're working with them with their curriculum specifically so that, as, as um, Mr. Kassenich said, said, that if they go through junior, senior year and they use our first year curriculum, then they, they can take a test when they graduate and start in as a second year apprentice at 18 years old. So it's, you know, we're, we're doing what we can, but again, go back to before they've made their decision to, to, to expose them. And it's not an expensive task. It's just a matter of the school systems recognizing the issue and, and just change your scheduling. That's all you have to do. Dr. Johnson, any further thoughts on that? Or uh, Mr. Dernbach. Yeah, I think you know what we need to do is reduce the silos as well. You know, there there are a lot of resources, but for the state of Wisconsin, we need flexibility. You know, because what works in Kentucky doesn't necessarily work in Wisconsin. So, giving us, you know, we have resources, giving us the flexibility to use those resources to target innovative. Like for Wisconsin, you know, we've got a very rural area, so we want to use those funds to do a mobile lab, mobile job center to get up in some of those rural areas because that may not necessarily work in the Milwaukee area. So anything we can get for flexibility is extremely helpful. And then you know, anything we can do to break down the silos between the departments to make administering the programs on our end a lot easier would be much appreciated. Thank you. I appreciate it. I yield back. You know, the gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Polis from Colorado for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman Guthrie and making member Davis. Uh, this is a very important hearing. You know, apprenticeships like we've discussed this morning, can be a very important tool for connecting Americans to good paying jobs and real careers. And while the topic of apprenticeships is more relevant than ever before, it's certainly not a new one. For decades, uh, unions have been connecting Coloradans with apprenticeship programs to provide quality education and on-the-job training. I'm also proud that Colorado is leading the way to connect students with apprenticeships through a new 
public-private partnership known as CareerWise, which is the goal of training 20,000 students for need-based high-paying jobs through uh, apprenticeships in fields like technology, hospitality, and finance. Students take courses, get hands-on experience, even get paid while they're in high school, uh, often with the option of going straight into the workforce or continuing their education uh, in college. A uh, first question is for Dr. Johnson. Uh, in Denver, the Career Education Center Early College Magnet School prepares students for the workforce by providing career technical education courses through dual and concurrent enrollment. In Greeley, Colorado, uh, Ames Community College launched an early college high school where students earn their associate's degree at the same time as they earn their high school diploma. Concurrent enrollment uh, really works well for supporting first generation students and others to help them attain an associate's degree and a great education, uh, even putting them on a path to a four year college if they choose. In your testimony, you mentioned that IEC apprentices are eligible for college credit during their apprenticeship, uh, which is incredibly valuable if they choose to go on in their education. Can you talk more about the system for awarding credits to apprentices? Yes, we do have a program as well where you can uh, co-enroll while you are in high school and work toward, if not complete, your associate's degree through the community college. Uh, we also do work closely with the career and technical education so that uh, we can try to align in every way possible the curriculum that they have in high school and as juniors and seniors and if they don't complete that then continues forward, that that curriculum is what businesses want and then businesses are connected with the, with the program as part of it, with the industry tours, with the mentoring, uh, provide, coming into the, into the classroom and talking about what it means to be part of that uh, industry and part of that occupation. And Mr. Kucinich, does Wisconsin also award college credit for apprenticeships and what interaction do you have with dual and concurrent enrollment systems? Well, most the apprenticeship programs that are operated in partnership with our community or technical college programs, if the individual completes the right hours and the right classwork, they're going to earn they're going to earn credits in that in that system. So transferable to college, to a, to a four year college, yeah, it could be if there's articulation for sure. First, it would be through a two year, then to a four year. Right, right. And in addition, a lot of the programming that we operate in our registered apprenticeship program, the related instruction uh, awards industry related. Credentials, so there's kind of a, a tool, a two for it. It's not just getting the college credit, but you're also getting industry-recognized credentials and certifications. Uh, and can you uh, talk about your work in Wisconsin to support the access to apprenticeships for traditionally underserved and underrepresented populations, and how you how you reach out and make sure that they're represented? Well, I think it's a, there's a combined effort. The State uh, Department of Workforce Development, Bureau of Apprenticeship Standards, does a great job of pushing marketing information. I know that they've been supported through some of the recent federal investments has been very helpful. In addition, we do a lot of partnership at the local level. Um, we're very involved with outreach and marketing. Uh, we're active in all parts of the state. So there's a, there's a pretty concerted effort. We have a pretty proud tradition in Wisconsin. Great, well, thank you. And I, I also wanted to follow up and ask, um, with, with regard to your testimony, Mr. Kucinich, you mentioned, of course, that the continuity between the different systems, the vocational, K-12, higher ed, is so important. I was wondering what more that Congress can do to empower local and state governments to work together across all those kinds of different entities to create a seamless solution for workforce development for, for young people. Well, it's two part for us. So as an, as an intermediary, that is our function for our industry, and we try to bridge together those interests. But there's also the, the need to you know, strengthen the workforce development system, the workforce board system across the state of Wisconsin. They are critical partners to us in making sure that there is you know, both an industry-driven strategy as well as a public interest strategy that meets both industry demand and also community and civic needs. So I think those two, those two parts of the system need investment, they need support, and they need uh, stronger, uh, stronger support out of this body. Thank you, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Byrne from Alabama for five minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind words earlier about my district. We've come through the storm pretty well, uh, but we're going to have some people need to have their power turned back on, so I appreciate those linemen for working. Great panel. Really love what y'all are doing. I'm the former chancellor of post-secondary education in the state of Alabama, former chair, chairman of the State Workforce Planning Board, so this is stuff that's near and dear to my heart. Now, when I was in that position, I remember my staff working on getting federal grants 
And it's like the worst headache I've ever had trying to figure out how to get through all these federal programs, federal grants. You know, we're from the federal government. We're here to help you. Let's see how difficult and complicated we can make it for you. And I, but I never really dug into it that much, to be honest with you. We just said, you know, that's the feds. Go do what you got to do. Then I get here, and I get on this committee, and I start poking around, and I find that there are 44 workforce training programs at the federal government spread among eight different agencies, 44 programs across eight different agencies. So, Dr. Bachman, we'll start, start with you, but I'd like to hear all of you could. Do you have any experience how to navigate through this sort of a maze, or do you think we need to be streamlining this and have fewer programs across fewer agencies? From an administrative perspective, yes, anything you can do to streamline makes that great. Um, I can tell you in the state of Wisconsin, I've got my counterpart on speed dial for Department of Children and Families and Department of Human Services. We have Food Share, which is a large employment and training program, and then also you've got Wisconsin Works and our Children and Families, a very large employment program. So, you know, under Governor Walker, he's made that effort very clear that we all have to work together. But, you know, I can tell you, especially with administering WIOA, you have the Department of Labor and you also have the Department of Education, because we also have the people with uh, disabilities as well. And sometimes those regulations may be a little different. So anything you can do to help streamline on our end and provide flexibility for us so we can work with our locals to get them the training they need to get their workforce into, into employment as quickly as possible would be much appreciated. Dr. Johnson, what about you? From a local perspective, uh, we find that we need to do whatever we need to do, boots on the ground, to work with the people that are in our communities to pull it all together and make it happen. So when you talk about all of the programs at the federal level, and then you take that down to the state level where there's 24 workforce programs, over four secretaries, and so it compounds it again when they put the, the requirements and so forth on top of that. Then it comes down to the local level. And we can make things happen when we figure out a way to work together at the local area to make it happen. So we work with what we have. Right. And we would like to see uh, additional streamlining, anything that could help us deliver services more efficiently and more effectively at the local level and have us, we can work to make each other work together at the local level, but sometimes it sure would help to have uh, a carrot or a stick higher up to, to also make it happen as well. Well, I mean, in, in workforce development, I mean, one of the problems I had is people come to me and say, I do workforce development. And I would say, really, tell me who you teach. And they say, oh, I don't teach anybody. I said, well, what are you doing for workforce development if you're not teaching them? We don't realize that it's, that's the granular level that we got to get it to. A classroom with a qualified instructor with students that are there that have what they need, and we know that they need a lot, some of them need a lot more things, I think you alluded to this earlier, than just a textbook. Some of them need transportation or childcare or whatever their problems are. And we've got to get them that instructor in that right place. But we have so much stuff between that classroom and the place where the money starts. And the more we pile on there, the more difficult it is for you to get that classroom put together. It seems to me it should be our goal to reduce the number of things that are between the source of the money and that classroom. So I know you're saying we're going to work together and we're going to do what we've got to do. It's what my staff did. We're going to work together. But we're in the way because we make it so difficult for you. I know you're going to do the best you can with what you got, but wouldn't you agree that if we gave you fewer programs that you had to work with and fewer agencies, that you could devote that time you've been devoting to all that complexity to actually teaching those students? Yes, and actually supporting those individuals that we need to support to get them up to the point that they can enter into an educational program or a work experience or whatever, but getting them, yes, it would help to, um, uh, it, it would help us if the process could be streamlined and less regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. And we're going to continue with members of the subcommittee, and then we'll transfer to members of the full committee who have asked to be here today. We appreciate that. But I will now recognize Mr. Grothman from Wisconsin for five minutes. For We have some badgers here for you to... Yeah, we got two of them here, so <laughs> it's kind of a Wisconsin-heavy panel, which I like. Um, I actually knew Mr. Dernbach in his days back in the state capitol, so I'm glad to see you caught up to me here in, in uh, Washington. Um, 
I, I did work uh, to improve the apprenticeship programs in, in Wisconsin when I was there. Um, one of my concerns, though, is what is the average age of the person which you described as an apprenticeship program in Wisconsin? I just pulled up the stat in the state of Wisconsin, the average age of an apprentice is 30 years old. Okay. Um, are there people who are apprentices or under 20? There are, but it's very limited. Okay, is there any reason why these people became apprentices at 29 or 30? And we, we talk about the word apprentice, I guess I prefer to use overall the word skills-based education. But is there any reason why these people at age 29 or 30 could not, had they realized it, uh, started on these programs when they were 18 or 19 or 20? No. Okay, so we have a problem here, and we have people going through 10 years of their life before they get what will be their life's work, 10 years of doing something else. Do you, do you have any idea how many of those apprentices either started college and did not graduate or even graduated from college before they realized that there are better careers available through the apprenticeship path? I don't have that specific stat, unfortunately. Okay, as I understand it, it's quite high. I, I know, and I don't know this is what you mean by uh, apprentices, but when I talk to people either in our tech schools or talk to people in, in the trades, it's not unusual to find people who have a four-year degree who wind up uh, looking for skills-based education. Do you think that's true? True in any other states, too? <laughs> Ask Dr. Johnson or Ms. Reynolds. Yep. Yep. I've personally hired three or four men over the years that come to me. One had a psychology degree and decided he couldn't make any money at that, so he went through our apprenticeship program and became a master electrician. Very, very common. I'll then bring up in something that Mr. Burns said here. Do you think the biggest problem is not the lack of programs, but um, people not doing a good enough job of explain or young people not making the right decisions? I guess I'll put it that way. Yes, very much so. Very much so. They're not given the the thought process to develop, you know, to to think through what they want to do with their lives. They're just told to jump up and go to college and then figure it out. And, and we should go the other way. We should say figure it out before you go to college because you might not want to do that. Some people in Wisconsin are coming around, but I'll, I'll ask the rest of you. I'll ask uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, the other gentleman from Wisconsin there. I'm not going to mispronounce your name. Do you, do, you, do you feel we have a problem and that too much of our education establishment is not doing a good job of pushing people towards skills-based education, and because they are not doing a good job of that, we wind up having people wildly in debt before they pursue a skills-based education at age 29. I mean, it seems to me wherever I look, say even my construction trades, they're forever looking for people, they complain they can't find people. So the openings are there. Okay, the openings are there in the tech school. The problem is people lack the will to fill those slots when they are young. Does anybody disagree with that? I wouldn't disagree with that, but I would say in today's age, a lot of the younger people that we're seeing are in no position to be making the career choice that they believe is gonna last a lifetime at 18 or 19 or 20. Why not? These are good careers. Why wouldn't they make that decision first? What do you mean they're in no position to do that? Some people are doing it. People always used to do it. How can you say people who are 18 or 19 are not in a position to go the apprenticeship route. A, a lot of the young people that we see coming into our programs, whether they're coming in out of school youth programs or they're other coming out of high school, simply I would I would say, say um, in my judgment, lack the maturity to understand what the career choices are and the confidence to know that if they take the step toward an apprenticeship or for or, you know a skilled trade, that there's that there's going to be security there and really. To build a career. People always used to be able to make those decisions when they were 18 or 19, 40 years ago. Do you really feel the problem is today the students are just lack the maturity and they cannot make the decisions in which, which edu type of education they could pursue at age 19, unlike what students have been doing throughout all human history? I don't know. Um, I I do, do you blame to a certain extent um, the education establishment and that includes the high schools, the guidance counselors, that sort of thing, um, towards leading these young people down a path, say, I don't want to say wasting 10 years of their life, but taking 10 years to make a decision they should have made in one month. 
Anybody can speak up. Sure, Ms. Reynolds, you're going to agree with me. Say. Very much so. Um, I, I think that the youth of today, I'll, I'll use the term millennial, any of those that I've been around that are in the first year program really don't have an urgency to get on with life. They've been coddled, if you will, by the system, and they've not, they've not had um, to achieve anything. They, the, the Kentucky, I'm talk, speaking for Kentucky, their school system tends to give you a gold star just for showing up, and they don't really encourage uh, being aggressive and, and, and competitive, so therefore these kids are coming out just fluffy and happy and not having a clue what it is that life brings. Okay, well, we're about out of time here. I, I just will far, say, yeah. I guess we're all kind of little bit of community leaders in my area, and when I'm back home, I always push skills-based training on young people, and I hope the rest of us do too. Thank you. We do. Thank you very much, Mr. Grothman. I appreciate uh, your testimony yielding back. I now recognize Mr. Allen for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all of you for being with us today. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I'm concerned about, uh, and when we talk about, you know, ages and, it, it, you know, how do we get young people to focus on the reason they're getting an education, for example? Uh, third graders, um, I love to talk to third graders. They're very honest with you. And we know that if a third grader is not reading at the third grade level when they finish the third grade, they're probably not going to graduate from high school. And so that's an important age. And I encourage the business community to get third graders out on those, on those manufacturing floors and out in, uh, on those farms and whatever business you've got to kind of open their eyes to, you know, hey, this, I could do this. And because I, so many of them, I, I really don't think they know, think they've got a, a chance to do these things. I know with my own experience, uh, you know, I had odd jobs off the farm, but uh, usually it was sweeping floors and cleaning toilets and things like that until I finally got a job in a steel fabricator and I learned that welders make a lot more than those folks sweeping the floors. And I talked uh, my boss into allowing me to be a welder, which allowed me to get through college. So, uh, you know, again, uh, Ms. Reynolds, in your testimony, you talk about the lack of exposure young people receive to the skilled trades. And uh, how are you working with local school districts to encourage exposure of these career opportunities to young people looking for those in-demand career uh, opportunities? Well, at this point, I've been going out with my chapter and going to jo job fairs for seniors. They, they'll pull two or three schools together and have a gymnasium full of job opportunities. Um, and that's kind of all we can do. We'd like to tap into the veterans a little bit more, but their job fairs are cost prohibitive. So we've not been able to do anything other than talk with Fort Knox and their, um, their um, turnout specialists so that it's word of mouth is all we have. Um, but that's a really untapped uh, resource. Why are the veterans job fairs cost prohibitive? I don't know that answer. I just know that our particular chapter doesn't have the money to do that. I, I don't know what it costs yeah. to buy. School job fairs are free, so we do a lot of those. I got you, okay. So, um, but because, you know, the veterans are great. They're, they're, they're obviously disciplined, they're, they're punctual, they're knowledgeable, they're teachable. There's, there's nothing about a veteran that we don't want as electrical contractors, um, but we just can't seem to get to them. Right, well, uh, we need to figure out how to fix that cost prohibitive part, because we need yes. to get our veterans every opportunity that they deserve uh, to get back into the workplace. So. Uh, as far as the, uh, obviously the need is there uh, uh, for in, in, in the workforce. Uh, everywhere I go in the district, people need skilled people. So Dr. Johnson, uh, what's your biggest challenge? We've we got six million job openings out there and you know, you're part of the solution. What's your biggest challenge and how do we, how do we get these young people uh, on track as soon as possible and in the workplace? Uh, as far as dealing with, uh, and I'll talk about the high school students. I won't go down to third grade because I don't have much experience with that. But from the high school students, they really only know what they've seen their parents do and family members do. So it, there is that exposure to what the different occupations are, what the different industries are, that, that some at least that exist out there. We have been uh, using a program called World of Works where you have many industries come together and they make it a fun uh, interchange of what they do, what their, what their company does, what are highlight certain occupations and what they mean, what they do. And that exposes students to some things. But trying to 
uh, trying to get them on board. And I have to agree with some of what was said before to make decisions uh, when maybe they haven't made many decisions before and when uh, even worse when they've made very bad choices and don't have the traditional support system that existed years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it is yeah. more complex that way. And you bring up an interesting point because they see what their parents do and then of course we've got 25% of the country that is, that is kind of stuck in poverty, living at, at or below the poverty level and sometimes, you know, mom and dad aren't able to work or aren't working. And so that young person, you know, I mean. Has never been around an adult that's been working. Exactly. Yes. And so how do we change that? I would love to have the answer to that. <laughs> um, it, again, it goes back to when you get into problems like that, they're so deep and they're so complex it's going to take a long time to turn those situations around. Well, you know, we've been doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result, and we know the definition of that, and we need to do something different. And so I'm open to your ideas, and I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back, and that concludes the uh, members of the subcommittee. We have members of the full committee. Is that every, yeah, that is everyone. And before I recognize Ms. Bonamici, I know we lost a great American hero last week and a lot of news coverage, and deservedly so here in D.C., but you lost a family member that was a great American as well, a Neil Simon, who uh, I just absolutely loved his humor, and his humor was not cutting or biting against people, and I think it's more clever, to, and that it's more difficult to write humor the way that he did it to make things funny, but I remember seeing Brighton Beach Memoirs when I was in college and on Broadway, and the whole, I won't spoil it because you need to go watch it if you haven't. I assume it's autobiographical, so your family Absolutely. must really enjoy <laughs> watching that. But the whole context is you laugh till you cry, but the whole context in the play is what's going on in Germany. And it's set in the 1930s, and, uh, and I guess your husband's family. Right. And uh, it, it, it proved a point. I won't spoil it, but you left laughing the whole time in the end. You know, wow. So he proved his point through humor, and he didn't do it with cutting people down. He did it by building people up. And... He's going to be, he's a great American and will be missed. So uh, Thank you after that, I'll recognize you for five minutes. Th Thank you for your kind words, Chairman Guthrie. It's a tremendous loss for our family, but also for the country. Uh, we need more humor today. Um, so thank you for letting me uh, join your subcommittee today as a full committee member. I represent a district out in Northwest Oregon, and you know, I still hear from uh, many people who are struggling. They feel left out of the economic recovery that is, is happening for some, but, but not for everybody. And if they have a job, their wages are stagnant, they may feel overwhelmed by barriers like housing costs or transportation or childcare. And certainly uh, apprenticeships is a way to help uh, more people get into good paying, stable careers and provide our nation's businesses with a workforce that will improve productivity and efficiency. I wanna to talk just a little bit about what we've been discussing in terms of how do we let people know about these opportunities. I, I certainly didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 18. I was doing retail sales and never had any idea that I would become both a lawyer and a member of Congress. So we have to make sure that we expose students to opportunities. Manufacturing day is a great day to do that. It's coming up on October 5th. I always participate with, with students, with manufacturers uh, in the district. Also, career and technical education, which this committee has been working on and expanding those CTE opportunities. And then for the students who are in college, work study, and I've been working with Mr. Byrne on a, a work study proposal to align work study jobs with students' interests so they can get more experience and find out if that is something that they want to pursue. Uh, there's a great model out in Oregon, the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center, also known as OMIC. Uh, and it's an advanced manufacturing facility. It's just uh, in the initial stages now, but tremendous potential, uh, both workforce development and research in advanced manufacturing. There's some industry leaders. Boeing is one of the, the industry leaders, but they're close to 20 private sector partners and working with Oregon Institute of Technology, Oregon State University, Portland State University, and Portland Community College. And they're developing there, in addition to the Research and Development Center, a registered apprenticeship program in advanced manufacturing. And it's a tremendous opportunity. It's in a pretty rural part of uh, the district I represent. Uh, great opportunities with that public-private partnership. Um, and for those who still face job insecurity, 
We should be expanding those work-based learning uh, programs, and especially, as I heard mentioned here this morning, to sectors that lack well-established apprenticeship programs. And I've worked with uh, my colleague, Drew Ferguson, Congressman Drew Ferguson from Georgia, to introduce the Bipartisan Partners Act to invest in those industry partnerships that help workers and businesses access the skills they need to stay competitive. And like uh, OMIC, these industry partnerships can bring together uh, employers, schools, training providers, community-based organizations, under the Partners Act, industry partnerships would help the businesses recruit workers, develop the curriculum, and importantly, break down some of those barriers. Access to tools, access to, if there's a uniform, transportation, childcare services, mentorship, using existing funds. Those support services help retain uh, employees and also uh, get them through and com to completion of the program. It's one piece of the, this Partners Act is one piece of the greater need to invest in apprenticeships and other paid on the job training programs. And I wanted to ask Mr. Kesenick, what can Congress do to support coordinated multi-employer apprenticeship programs and strong industry partnerships that respond to local workforce needs? And how would this model help connect, especially underserved, underrepresented uh, individuals that you talked about? And, and if you could include in there, what is the value of providing these wraparound services to workers? All parts are critical. As an intermediary, that's the function very similar to OMIC we do in Wisconsin, in particular Southeast Wisconsin. We're able to convene industry on its own terms, and in our case it's a labor management partnership, and to really define what's necessary, what's needed, what's, what's the future. But you know, one of the things that's important about expanding the apprenticeship programs is, you know, this is a contract, this is an investment that both business is going to make and, and a worker is going to make in terms of going back to school, getting education. So, to be able to articulate that and, and really make sure that both sides of that supply and demand understand the commitment and the contract that's involved there. That if I'm going to take the risk and, and I'm going to put my family on the line, in many cases, that that apprenticeship program is going to support me for two, three, four years. I, I, can, I can bank on if I do everything I'm supposed to do, my employer is going to do everything that they need to do, and my, and my family can depend on that. So it's, it's critical. Great. In, in the brief few seconds, I have a background in consumer protection. I'm very wary about the shift away from registered apprenticeships because I don't want it to come at the cost of quality training and support. So as um, the department is moving forward looking at regulations for third-party certification, how can we make sure that workers are actually getting uh, the experience and the quality that will provide them with portable credentials and high wages and a pathway to a permanent job? Mr. Kessner. I'm not, I'm not really able to answer that because I'm not really sure what the department's intent would be with that. At this point, there are a lot of credential programs, um, certification programs in many sectors, and employers use them. And so those independent, uh, you know, credentialing bodies would have to provide information back to, you know, back to this body, I imagine, if you ask for it. Thank you. I see my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I, I guess I just have to ask you, when you got married, did they tell you that anything you say or do could end up on Broadway or in a movie? <laughs> they didn't warn you, huh? <laughs> okay. Good. Well, thanks so much. And that does conclude all of our, our questions. And I really appreciate the panel for being here. This is something that we're all trying to work to get to the right level. And how do we make apprenticeships meaningful, the registered or whatever other standard that we have that people can be portable and they're trained and have access to, to good work. And that's what we want. Because we don't want people to just have jobs, we want them to have careers. And understand that going into the skilled trades is a career, is a career path. And a lot of times it makes a lot more money than people have a four year or even more degree. And so we really appreciate the efforts of all you to be here. And I will recognize my ranking member, ranking member Davis for any closing remarks you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all of you for, for being here. And, and in many ways, I think perhaps you would agree with me that we're, 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 kind of, we're certainly ready, I think, as, uh, as a subcommittee to move forward on many of the kinds of ideas that we've been hearing and that you've presented as well. I mean, we, you know, young people and, and even people in, in a transition can't be what they can't see, and we need to provide more opportunities for that. But I think we also don't want to um, kind of uh, dilute programs or take away from programs that actually are working. It is up to the local governments and, and local entities to help knit together that which exists. And I think we want to deepen some of that, perhaps expand it, make sure that those investments don't go away, um, and uh, acknowledge that there are some different approaches out there. But I think a lot of them, most of them, I think, can actually fit into the existing resources that we have, and we need to be careful 
um, that we don't do anything to erode those. So thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much, and, and I've said a lot, so I will just appreciate the time and effort for you guys to be here and how important this is just to the economic success of our country to continue the, the GDP growth that we have. As I think Ms. Reynolds said, you could grow, you could do 50% more work. I know that people are currently turning down loads. I have people who own trucking companies, some of them are turning down loads because they can't find CDL drivers who, you know, they start off one company, so they start them in the mid 40, 40K. Uh, for annual salary, that's just starting, and so, and that's not a four-year program, that's a five or six-week program, typically, to get that kind of level of work. So, we need to encourage it, we need to, to know, let people know in this country that we're focused on it and want it to happen because it makes their lives better, and they're needed. It makes our country better. So, we appreciate that, and without any objection, there being no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned.